back with another great panel, myself and Fabo, we will be uh, moderating this uh, session. So our panelists include uh, Nona Dorothy, a leading expert on millennium and generation Z, uh, Stephen Downs, a Canadian philosopher and commentator, and uh, Nadia Nafi, uh, who is the assistant professor of educational technology, but she's also the chair of uh, educational technology at the uh, Université Laval. So welcome to our panelists. Excellent. Um, I think I am supposed to jump in first uh, to start us off. So it's lovely to be with all of you um, on this Wednesday afternoon. My name is Ilona Doretti, and I'm the Managing Director of the Youth and Innovation Project at the University of Waterloo. And I come from a background that was really, has been focused on being a young leader myself, then uh, founding an organization that was encouraging young people to vote and encouraging young people to get involved in their communities. And now at the University of Waterloo, our research is focused on the unique abilities of young people and rethinking the role that, the, that young people have in society and the economy. So I wanna start off by just telling a little story to frame, frame my presentation. So when I was a kid growing up in Whitehorse, Yukon, my parents sent me to elementary school in a t-shirt that read question authority now i was always the kind of young person who already was comfortable with speaking my mind but that t-shirt really taught me that i had something of value to say and that my voice deserved to be heard but it certainly didn't make life easy for my teachers and the other adults in the school when in grade seven, I got all of my classmates to sign a petition because I didn't think the results of a test were fair. Or a few years later, when I called out one of my teachers on local radio for modeling what I thought was inappropriate behavior. Or when I told my principal that they were wrong because uh, they wouldn't let me start a student council. Now you can imagine if I was already speaking my mind so clearly in elementary and high school you can only imagine what i was like in university and i certainly took the opportunity for my time at university to be one where i made my voice heard and i encouraged encouraged my peers to do the same what we've learned through our research work at the university of waterloo at the youth and innovation project is that when I was young, I was doing exactly what young people are supposed to do. The role of young people is not to make things easy for adults. The role of young people is to innovate, to challenge the status quo, to take risks, and by doing so, if we work together in an intergenerational context, we will come up with the solutions that we need for the complex problems we are all facing. I love the Grace Hopper quote. The most dangerous phrase in the language is we've always done it this way. Doing things the same way we've always done them just because that's the way things have been done certainly doesn't find solution to, to complex problems. It doesn't fix those problems. It doesn't make our community and our society better. What does make things better is really valuing the unique abilities that we all have to offer, whether we're young or older, and really ensuring that we're tapping into those unique abilities uh, that we all have to make, to work together in intergenerational collaboration. That we really focus on keeping what works, but also being brave enough to change what doesn't work. So since my time growing up in the Yukon and being a, a little bit of a rebel in elementary school and high school, I've been fortunate enough to work with tens of thousands of young people, both across Canada and, and around the world. 
And what I've really learned is that my story is not the ex exception to the, or my story, sorry, is not the exception, but it's the rule. My unique abilities when I was young to really think about things in a different way and challenge the status quo is not unique. What was unique is that I was fortunate enough to have adults around me who really valued my contributions and supported me in speaking up. When we value what young people have to offer and support them in contributing, we, not, we may not make uh, our lives particularly easy in the short term. They may make things challenging for us, but we are ensuring a bright future for them. And we're taking a big step towards ensuring that our communities and our societies thrive. So I'm gonna share a little bit with you today about some of our research and what are those unique abilities of young people and how this might get us to rethink post-secondary education, rethink uh, how our education system works and what it looks like. But first I wanna just share a little bit about where we are with our understandings and our perceptions of young people today and how that might be limiting us. So we have, we've looked back, uh, so our work at, at, at the Youth and Innovation Project is done from very much an interdisciplinary perspective. And it's one where we don't just rely on market research, we don't just rely on kind of polling to understand young people. We want to really understand young people from a holistic perspective. And so one of the things that we've done is we've looked back uh, at, the, at history to really understand, okay, what are the mainstream Western narratives when it comes to what it means to be young? Uh, and how is this impacting our intergenerational ways of collaborating? So what I'm gonna share with you is a little historical story. Now, certainly I only have a 20 minutes uh, to speak with you about this today. So there will be some generalizations in, in my, my little story, but hopefully uh, it, it will give you a sense of some of the underlying narratives um, that impact how we, how we understand young people. And that what we really see from our research is that quite often young people are, are stuck in what we, we call an endless rehearsal for adulthood. So we have a tendency to really view young people as learners who when they're young should just learn. And as they get older, they can contribute, but that's kind of down the road. So I wanna share with you, how did we get to this point where we really view young people uh, as, as just learners, not contributors while they're young? How did we stick them in this endless rehearsal for adulthood? So to understand how we got here, it's important to think back, uh, look back at history, and what I like to, the way I like to frame it is we're stuck in a 200 year old stereotype about what it means to be young. So again, these are broad strokes, but hopefully it, it helps paint a picture of, of how we view young people in mainstream Western society. So the dominant narrative about what it means to be young changed about 200 years ago with the Industrial Revolution. So before the Industrial Revolution, there was a much smaller gap between childhood and adulthood. So we tended to transition from childhood to adulthood quite quickly. There was more of an apprenticeship model. So there was an idea that as soon as a young person was able to take on a certain responsibility, they were given that responsibility. So whether it was helping out on the family farm, uh, working in the fields, helping out in the house, young people were given responsibility much sooner. And as they were able to graduate to more responsibility, they did. Researchers talk about how young people were economically essential to the family unit in the context of, uh, of families before the Industrial Revolution. So then as, as we started to shift to the urban context as, as during the Industrial Revolution, as, as we started to work more in factories, certainly at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, child labor and the young people's labor was, uh, was certainly part of what um, was essential and certainly problematic in the early days of the Industrial Revolution. But as technology improved, young people were less necessary in the context of factories. 
And <laughs> as a result, all of a sudden, we had young people who were kind of wandering the streets of these urban communities with not a lot to do. And the first words we hear used to describe this new phase of life that was starting to come to be, this phase of life that we now call, adole call adolescence or youth, uh, was actually juvenile delinquents. So this was the first time we, the kind of language we started using to describe this new phase of life. So young people from the beginning of when we started to identify this phase of life, that phase of life has been criminalized. Um, and so we had to figure out, or the society wanted to figure out what's the solution for these young people who are kind of roaming the streets with not a lot of, to do and get, getting in trouble. Well, one of the solutions was school. So the beginning of our man, more mandatory education system was very much had several many goals, uh, one of which was to train future workers, but another one of which was to control the urban poor. Now there are of course many benefits to education, and that's one of the things um, all of us are talking about here uh, during this conference. But there are also uh, things that our education resulted in certain things that are maybe not so great. And one of those was a shift in our understanding of what it means to be young. Again, from young people being economically capable, very valuable to the family unit in terms of their economic potential. And it shifted to where we no longer saw young people as capable members of society, but more members of society that needed to be controlled and also protected. So as education becomes something that, that is more uh, kind of consistent across all classes, and becomes more mandatory, we see more and more of a separation between childhood and adulthood. By the 1900s, we see a generation gap kind of starting to come, come around uh, that is one that's really driven by more conflict. We start hearing the idea of peer culture, so now that all young people are kind of together in one spot, marketers start targeting the 1920s, and by the 1940s, we start seeing uh, and I, the idea of youth culture coming into our, our lexicon. So what has that led to? What does that mean in terms of how we understand young people today? Well, age as a basis for organizing our society is certainly not something that's new. But what is new over the last 200 years is chronological, <laughs> chronological age being a central feature of how we organize society. And now, 200 years later, what has that resulted in? It's resulted in a separation of young people from the world of adults. So we live in an age-graded society where young people and adults, uh, in except when it comes to the family unit, tend to spend most of their time uh, apart. We also have seen a disengagement and a continued disengagement of young people from economically productive activities. We no longer see young people as, as useful. Secondly, and this I think comes from these ideas, is that we have a sense of fear and othering. So we tend to view young people as a dangerous other a cohort that needs to be controlled and protected. And certainly, this is just annoying for some young people. It's, uh, you know, it's frustrating, but not the end of the world. For other young people, it's actually dangerous when it comes to intersectional identities. This can lead to literally a, a matter of life or death for young people. And thirdly, we have an understanding of what it means to be young uh, as, as a time of life where we're becoming something. And being a, an adult as a time of life where we are something or our identity is complete. Now, um, many of you will, will know Eric Erickson, who certainly was, was one of the folks who really cemented this idea. And, and some argue that this actually wasn't um, what he meant, but certainly it's, it's become our understanding uh, of various uh, life stages or, or phases of our lives. And, but this is really, a, a kind of central idea in terms of how we built our systems and our institutions when it comes to young people. 
and how how we really view young people that young people are incomplete they are an empty vessel that we need to fill with information and that at one at some kind of random point down the line they will finally um, be be complete and that's when they can start contributing now these three really big complex ideas again which i sort of raced through today um, are the underpinning of, of some things that we often don't take very seriously which is stereotypes of kind of these these uh, memes that we see or these these uh, snippets in the media about how millennials are ruin, ruin, ruining their lives because they love avocado toast. You know, we hear this stuff in the media all the time, and I think it's really important not to dismiss it, but really to understand that these stereotypes are actually rooted in 200 years of history, and they have real impacts in terms of how our institutions are set out set up and how we value or do not value young people. So we have a great opportunity to really recognize that those stereotypes are not the whole picture and that young people really have some incredible things to offer. We have an opportunity to reinvent what it means to be young and to rethink the stage of life. And so at the Youth Innovation Project, we started really investigating what do we know from the neuroscience and developmental psychology that might help us to really reimagine the stage of life grounded in evidence, and as a result, how help us to really re rethink our institutions uh, so that we are tapping into the incredible value that young people possess. So when we looked at the latest research in neuroscience and developmental psychology, we really wanted to understand um, that we hear the narrative in the media when it comes to young people's brain development that young people's brains don't fully develop until they're about 25 years old. And, uh, and so they don't reach this level of maturity, so to speak, until they're about 25 years old. And when we looked more into the research, we were, we were able to really clearly see that that's actually only half of the story. When some parts of our brains have, are fully developed, the reality is actually some other parts of our brains have already reached the peak of their ability and our abilities are starting to decline. And for all of us who are over 25 years old, the really great news, and I think that the field of developmental psychology is really shifting with this great news to understand that our brains keep changing throughout our lives and we are better at certain things. We have certain raw abilities at, at, at certain points of our lives and other amazing raw abilities at other points in our lives. As we get older, we get better at emotional intelligence. We get better at strategizing and having contextual knowledge, all of these wonderful things. But what we do know is that before we hit this, this arbitrary definition of maturity at, at 25 years old, there's actually incredible abilities that young people possess that have already peaked and are starting to decline. So if we wait until young people hit this arbitrary definition of maturity before we meaningfully engage them in our organizations and our, our societies, we will have missed out on unique abilities that young people only possess while they're young. So some of these unique abilities are that young people's creativity is at the neurobiological rate. Uh, neuro, our neuroplasticity is heightened uh, during, during this time of life, which means that young people are natural experimenters who are more open to new ideas and new experiences than at other times in our lives. And young people are more observant and more aware of what's going on around them. And cer certainly we hear in society, the, the narrative that young people are risk takers, and and we we often hear about the negative sides of risk, but the reality is also that risk is absolutely essential if we hope to solve problems. And when researchers in the U.S. looked at what kind of risks are young people talking about, 
needing to take in their lives and, and wanting to take, they tend to talk about positive risks that will move their communities forward and their lives forward. They don't focus on negative risks. So that's, it's important that we catch up with young people and we recognize the importance of risk taking. So just to finish off my, my very short little uh, view <laughs> of some of the different parts of our research, I wanna leave you with three questions. The first is, what, if, what would happen to our universities, to our post-secondary institutions, our colleges, if young people's new ideas were viewed as equally as important to society as the knowledge and wisdom we have to offer them, how would our institutions look different? How would teaching look different? How would classrooms look different? How would what it means to have a degree or a diploma look different? Secondly, what if our universities and colleges were age integrated? What would that mean for our institutions, our classrooms, how we teach, what young people and what those of all ages learn? And thirdly, if we recognized that we have something of value to contribute at all stages of our lives, but we also always have something to learn, no matter how old or young we are, how would that change how we view post-secondary education, when it happens in the lifespan, when young people start working and start contributing uh, in that way, <laughs> what would it mean for experiential learning, what would it mean for volunteering, what would it mean for our communities if we really recognize that we always have something of value? We are always already something. We are something. We are being. <laughs> and we all are also always becoming at all stages of our lives. What would that mean for institutions? So I started off um, my young academic career in elementary school challenging authority and really understanding the value of my voice. And now I work hard uh, at the University of Waterloo, but also our work is across Canada and the US to ensure that young people's voices are heard, but also that we really recognize the value of intergenerational collaboration. So I, uh, I hope I have given you some ideas to think about and some questions to ask yourselves. And I very much look forward to hearing uh, the thoughts from my fellow panelists. Um, and thank you so much for, for your time today. Thank you very much, Ilona. And I'm sure that the students who all participated uh, into the student panel, uh, you know, this morning would have just loved, you know, to hear what you're saying. And maybe some of them are, are still actually participating into this, uh, uh, into this uh, symposium. So I'm wondering if uh, Nadia actually has, you know, thoughts to share and also maybe some uh, uh, answers to the question that Ilona uh, is asking. Go ahead, Nadia. Yeah, I'm gonna start. So thank, uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Ilona, for this uh, amazing presentation. Uh, it really like puts, you know, many questions that should be asked. As you were uh, presenting the story and you know going through your presentation, uh, I was thinking also about the project I'm working on. So I want to start with um, first of all, you talked about, and I'm looking at my notes because I was taking notes as you were <laughs> you were uh, presenting. So you you talked about how uh, comfortable you were uh, speaking your mind when you were uh, young, right? You questioned authority. We talked about uh, young who uh, young people who take risks. Um, you also talked about how we have to start uh, valuing the contribution of youth. So I want to take you, and I want—I really would like to hear you about 
um, a very specific context I'm working uh, within, which is the context of disinformation. So I've been working with youth for many years now, and uh, the, my recent project is on deepfakes. So deepfakes are videos and audios that are being generated by AI, and they are used for to spread disinformation on social media. So I'm working with youth to see how they can actually have a role in counterbalancing this disinformation. So have a role in really raising awareness about fake and raising awareness about this information, but also having a role, very uh, critical role in society to inform others, you know, your, their community, their friends, uh, people on their uh, network. And we know that youth, as you said, young people are not, you, you know, they are creative. We see them on TikTok. They have their voice. Uh, they're really expressing themselves. They, we see their presence. However, when it comes to issues that are really critical, such as disinformation, my participants, like the people who are uh, I've been working with and 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 meeting with, um, they realize their the importance of of having a voice and really contributing to counterbalancing the disinformation. However, they choose not to do it. So I'm working towards you know like how can we um, develop develop their agency online in digital context in specific things you know topics or you know um risks that we are all facing where they can actually have you know a, a, a very valuable contribution and one of the things that also stopped me when you were talking about how we view them what i noticed in my discussions with them is that what one of the things that is stopping them uh, is how they view their voice and how they view their contribution as if, you know, um, in the whole, you know, and everything that is being shared, my voice means nothing. Uh, how can I change the views of others? How can I, you know, make people uh, see other perspectives? Uh, so it's not worth it to be online. It's not worth it to have a voice. It's not worth it to be a contributor. So. Based on your research and what you've been discovering to now and all your you know, um, interactions with you, how can we move them from being, you know, because they are already creative and they are, they are aware of their, the, the, how, you know, the topic that is really um, risky for our society, but we need them to move towards being agents of change and agents who will actively counterbalance this information. That's a great, I mean, that's such a great question and it's so important. Um, and we, so we, through some of our work, well, most of our work is educating adults about the, the incredible value and untapped value of young people. And, but we realized a couple of years ago that we also needed to do exactly what you're talking about, which is make sure young people feel as though they have agency. So now very often when we're uh, doing those, those talks with adults, we'll also have a conversation with young employees or, or interns or volunteers in an organization and, and say, this is your, you know, this is your role, um, you know, and this is how you can amplify your impact. And I think part of the reason, honestly, uh, that we're dealing with this uh, is the reality that we expect young people to be passive in the context of education, right? So especially in elementary school and, and high school, you listen, you learn, that's your job, right? So young people's job is not to be contributors, it's to be learners. And to, so until we shift our institutions and our understandings of, of what it means to, to be young, to be that young people are both contributors and learners, uh, I don't think this is gonna, sh gonna shift, right? So, so we need to start instilling those ideas of I have something to, to contribute and I have value to offer, uh, certainly at a much younger age than we do now. Thank you very much, uh, Nadia and uh, Yona. Uh, now, uh, you know, Stephen, um, you know, from what you heard from Ilona, but also also the, the, the very interesting question of, uh, of Nadia, I wonder what would be your comments about that? So hi, everyone. Ooh, we're getting a bit of echo there. <laughs> hi, everyone. I'm Stephen Downs, and uh, I was billed as a commentator and philosopher, and I am that. Uh, but I'm also a researcher with the National Research Council of Canada. I've been at this for a long time. Uh, I specialize in learning and development, and especially in online learning and development. And it's given me a bit of a unique view on some of these issues. Um, 
But also what gives me, a, I think, a bit of a unique view is that uh, I was born in 1959. Now, number one, that makes me old. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I am. Uh, I would do something about that if I could. Um, but it more to the point makes me a member of what is called the Jones Generation. Now, you have never heard of the Jones Generation. Um, most people might classify me as a baby boomer and therefore entitled, privileged, thinking about myself, selling up my values and all of that. Or, you know, some people might think of me as Gen X, although probably not. Um, but I am definitely not a baby boomer and I am definitely not Gen X. Uh, I am part of that demographic that came in between these two big bumps in our demographics. There are hardly any of us. Um, and we're the Jones generation. Um, and uh, we kind of feel like we missed out on the 60s. I don't remember when Kennedy was shot. Um, I don't have all of those associations. So there is that. On the other hand, when I was young, I was a rebel. Uh, I wonder if young people haven't always been rebels. I think this is a phenomenon that existed long before the industrial age. Um, I remember clearly in grade seven, we were required to line up for class and I thought that that was demeaning. And so I convinced everybody in the line to put their hands on their heads and make sounds like chains clanking, for which I was sent to the principal's office. Ah, uh, good times. Um, you know, it's tempting to draw generalizations about being young. Um, but I'm always careful about that, you know, and, and my experiences as a Jones, um, really have brought that home for me. Uh, throughout my life, I haven't resembled other people of my generation. And look at me now. I mean, do I look like somebody who's an, you know, an old research scientist? Uh, well, maybe, but maybe not. Um, my recollection of being young, and I think probably the recollections of a lot of young people today, um, isn't so much the being trapped in this eternal state of becoming as a, opposed to actually being recognized as meaningful to society, but rather this eternal state of poverty, not having any money. Um, and when I was young, I found that most of my lack of power stemmed from that. Uh, People were willing to listen to me to the extent that I could get in the door, but usually I couldn't because I was dressed in, well, let's say not a suit and tie. Um, something that I've held on to ever since then because I don't want to forget. Um, but, you know, I never had the means to pursue the education that I wanted to pursue the vocations that I wanted. You know, almost everything costs money. Having an influence costs money. And I think that, you know, we, we talk about this artificial divide between uh, childhood and adulthood, but I think childhood resembles, you know, fast times in Ridgemont High rather than this cloistered environment. If you may, if you recall Fast Times in Ridgemont, well, maybe you don't recall Fast Times in Ridgemont High, that classic film of the 1980s, uh, where young people were depicted then as they are today, working in the mall, trying to figure out serious life issues on their own after school, and so on. Um, and that was my experience too, delivering newspapers selling greeting cards door to door. You, you know what I call, I did not call that entrepreneurship. What I called that was work. And I did it not because I wanted to do it. I did it because I had to, because that's the only way I could afford hockey nets. And I wanted hockey nets. Those are the sorts of things that people experience. And I, I'm sure they experience them today. You go into a Tim's 
and you'll see old people and young people, the people at the fringes of our society working for minimum wage or less than minimum wage jobs, and that's the reality. Um, so it's, it's not that we have these attitudes that is the problem, in my view. It's that um, we have a very distinct class-based system in society that is based in part on age, but not only on age. And, uh, you know, the graduation from childhood to responsible adult is something that we don't actually grant to large swaths of the population at all. Um, people of uh, people who are women experience that to some degree. Uh, people who are visual, visible minorities experience that to some degree, where we, we will question what we mean by we, but where society never quite treats them as full persons. Okay, so it's not a young person kind of thing. And I'm always wary of arguments that begin to tell us what we ought to do and how we ought to treat a class of people based on neuroscience or what their natural abilities are, etc. When, from my perspective, as someone who studied this for altogether too long a time, is that a significant, if not clear, outright majority of what becomes of them is based on their experiences and how we're treated. And just to challenge the thinking that is being proposed here, because we can tinker around the edges of the system, we can make our educational system more participatory, and you know, I certainly am an advocate of that. We can give young people more control over their own learning and development, and I certainly agree with that. And we could encourage them in their creative endeavors. I created my own newspaper when I was in grade five, uh, it was a terrible newspaper, but I still created it. And young people still do that today. And, you know, I actually take the time to watch their TikTok videos, which is what they're doing now. And I used to read their Facebook page. And I used to read their web pages when they did web pages. And I used to take part in their online games uh, when they built online games. And so you can see this, this creativity. It's not unique to young people. Uh, maybe they express it in slightly different ways, but the differences in how they express it when they're 14 and how they express it when they're 25 are, are less than the differences that in the way they express it when they're poor as opposed to when they're privileged. Much different. And I would make that the more important dividing line. And so I would pose the challenge, right? If we really want to embrace the capacity, the power, the relevance, the importance of young people, why don't we pay them the same as we pay adults? And I'll, I'll leave you with that question. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you for adding those layers of complexity in, uh, you know, in the problematic which is treated today in this, uh, in this panel. I'm sure, Ilona, that you want to answer to uh, some of the remarks that um, Stephen just made. Yes, I'm happy to. So first of all, Stephen, I feel like you and I would have really gotten along in elementary school. Uh, <laughs> I wish I'd had an ally <laughs> like you to, to be a rebel with. Um, I, I certainly, um, I think you've raised some really great points. And, and um, when I give a longer version of this presentation, I do go into the economic realities of young people today, and certainly um, those are very, you know, class realities and socioeconomic realities are, are um, very, I mean, they're, they're essential when we're having this conversation. And I would, the question you've asked is perfect. Um, we should be paying young people um, just as we are paying uh, adults, but similarly, we should be paying our elders just as much as we are paying um, those in the prime, right, right, uh, in the prime of their working life. I think, you know, I, our work is really around intergenerational collaboration. And, and as you very rightly pointed out, we see 
Uh, there are certain ages that are at the margins of our society, and we need to be recognizing um, the, the challenges with, with that dynamic. So our work is really about encouraging um, integration amongst different ages, right? Like, let's not stick seniors in long-term care facilities and young people you know, in places where they never meet anybody of any other age except for their parents and maybe grandparents. Um, let's let's start seeing what happens when we bring people together. Um, I just finished reading a wonderful book by um, a US activist named Mark Friedman called How to Live Forever. And it's all about intergenerational collaboration um, and the good life um, and, and just the importance of, of that collaboration uh, for leaving a legacy, but also living a good life. So absolutely, we need to put our money where our mouth is when it comes to this, uh, this work and, and paying young people um, that, you know, and truly valuing them economically is certainly part of this. So thank you so much for your comments. Um, uh, they're they're really valuable, and I again look forward to rabble rousing with you at some point. <laughs> Thank you, um, Nadia. I'm sure so that you want to add something to this uh, to this conversation. This is <laughs> these are questions that are really uh, very important to um, to ask. Um, I don't know if we can bring back. I've been I've been following the um, the day from the beginning. I went for an hour, but I came back immediately. And we've been talking the whole day about lifelong learning, the future uh, of work, uh, preparing our youth for uh, what's coming. And I was wondering because again we're as Stephen was saying, we can generalize. And as you were saying, you know, now we need to prepare our young, right, from even from school, right, uh, towards what's coming up after. So how do you think our goal in higher education um, would be to, to help young people develop these life learning, um, you know, uh, competencies to be ready for being adaptive, like, you know, the whole adaptability thing, the whole, um, because as a person, you know, you were, I, was, I maybe was in a certain way, but we're, we're all coming from all different, uh, from all different backgrounds and we've been transformed because of what we're living and what we're exposed to and etc. And even when I go back to my, um, the, the, the young people with whom I, I, I have very, really long discussions, like three hours discussions about this information, they realize like they, 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 they share that it's really based after these discussions that they uh, start to realize their their role and how they can really contribute etc so it's really based on what we're exposed to and how we are being you know living our different experiences so what is our goal if we want to go back to the main question of the day uh, in higher education what is our goal to bring our young to uh, to what's coming to the different futures right at the beginning of the day we talked about many futures that could be coming ahead thank you Stephen sorry just unmuting there um, while you were asking that question I quickly jotted down four points uh, as a response and and these these are the four things and, and Lana you'll probably agree with uh, four of them uh, <laughs> so uh, but let's see if we're capable of doing this and, and this is where the challenge you ask what the role is and it's one thing to have a role it's another thing to be capable of fulfilling that role and I'm not sure existing institutions of both schooling and higher education are, are capable of this role but uh, the four points first to the greatest extent possible um, give up control um, and I could go on for a long time about the, the layers and layers of control that we impose from everything from defining what counts as required or basic knowledge 
to conditions on pe the ways people express their views. You know, I'm, I'm a student journalist at heart, and there is a long and sorry history of administrations clamping down on student journalists. Simple example. To allowing people to, and, and including young people, to study and pursue what they want to study and pursue. You know, the vast majority of young people are, are fitted into this box of mediocrity. And it's only those rare cases where we see people able to pursue their dreams at a very young age that we see this sort of excellence in all across the disciplines. Uh, and if we could embrace that for all young people and not just for the few special and privileged, I think that would be very interesting. But are we able to do that? Are we ready as a society to do that? Second point, and this was mentioned explicitly, but I'll raise it again. Uh, have them able to work and learn alongside us, uh, making actual real contributions to real social needs and social goals. As I've often said, you know, young people and all people, to, to learn about forestry should be in a forest. To learn about law should be in a courtroom. Um, and they should be working on real problems. And there's a whole range of reasons for this, which are, you know, which speak to promoting learning and development, which I can't go into, but by the nods, I, I, I see the, uh, everyone else here is familiar with as well. Third, um, I have a slogan, um, enable, don't require. And that's an important slogan. Uh, in terms of practical application, what it means is that institutions, uh, as institutions, we should view our role, and I include my own institution in, in this as well, as providing support and assistance to people rather than telling them what to do. And it's the import, it's the support and assistance. Uh, it's approaching the educational environment by asking the question, how can I be helpful? Uh, not, you know, how can I get you to learn the things that I believe that you should learn, but rather, how can this particular educational activity help you achieve your goals and objectives? That's going to involve a conversation of some sort, probably. It may involve a negotiation. It may mean I can't help you. Um, that's the way it works sometimes. Um, but the idea here is to prioritize support over guidance. Uh, again, I'm not sure we're able to do that. And then finally, and I alluded to this in the first part, provide them with the means to implement their ideas and goals. And this is a broader social imperative. Um, you know, there was uh, Phil Hill, long, he's, he's another old guy like me, and he recently launched uh, a new educational venture. And he said, you know, uh, I got this opportunity with some venture capital funding and I took it because it was the only way that I could make an impact in my field. And I thought that was so sad that he'd gone through his life feeling he had no way of making an impact except to get venture capitalist funding and all the overhead that that entails. And that if he had had the means, and he probably did have some means because, you know, he's an independent consultant and contractor, uh, if he had had the means to implement some of his ideas when he was young, what would he have produced? Um, and again, it's not about being innovative and it's not about being entrepreneurial, right? These are values that we, as old people, are imposing on them. Oh, if only they would all be little entrepreneurs, society would be so great. No, 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 no. It's not up to us to say whether entrepreneurship, innovation, creativity, or whatever are the values that they should pursue. Rather, it's giving them, making sure they have the means to pursue these on their, on their own. Well, we've gone a long way toward that in society. We give them health care, uh, unemployment insurance, a good safety net. That's why Canada is such a productive, creative, and innovative country. These are happy side effects, not goals, right? Countries that don't have these supports have a much more difficult time getting this out of their young people. 
But I think that we need to be thinking about how we can make this possible, how we can change the environment of venture capitalist funding and you know vigorous competition for limited academic grants given only to university professors to something that can be applied on a much more wide basis and accessible to everybody and especially accessible to young people. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm wondering if our institutions, we still have you know, a long way to go towards the, the vision that you are you know, bringing, um, the three of you. Uh, but are we going into the right direction when we speak more and more in terms of institutions about community engagement, for instance, and where the community is coming more and more uh, within actually our institutions and that we try to have more mutually beneficial you know, relationship and uh, uh, project and our students are more and more involved actually in, uh, in the different projects. Are we going in the right direction here? You were speaking about intergenerational learning and education. The, the, the fact that, yes, we, our institutions are opening more towards the community, are we in that right direction? So I'd, I'd love to hear about, about that. Ilona, do you want to, to start? Sure. Um, so I'm certainly at an institution, the University of Waterloo, that has a, a very long history of work integrated learning and co-op and really recognizing um, the importance, as, as Stephen mentioned, of, of young people learning by doing. Um, so I, I do believe that, the, that what you mentioned, that the kind of community engagement and um, the, so, you know, the walls of the, of the university and colleges becoming more porous, so to speak, um, is definitely the right direction. Uh, but one thing I would say is I think we need to, there's, there's a, a big shift that still needs to happen, which is that we can't view whether it be whatever kind of work integrated learning or community engagement that happens, we can't view it as practice. And again, I'm, I'm building off one of Stephen's points um, because yes, I agreed with all your points, Stephen, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, we can't view it as practice. It has to be a real opportunity for young people to both have an impact and to use their abilities um, for the betterment of organizations or and or of communities so i think that's that's a really big shift um, that is not going to be easy for us to make so again really viewing young people as both contributors who have something of value to offer now and at the same time viewing both young people and all of us as learners um, so that that to me is a big is a big shift Thank you, Nadia. Yeah, I want uh, I want you to share uh, what you do at Université Laval. So we have what is called like the program of uh, Chantier d'Avenir. It's like a work play, the work site of the future, or something like that. Like I don't know what how to translate it, but this is an amazing program, and I was on several of the committee there. And what we do is we actually have groups of students who are coming from different. Uh, programs, right, or from different disciplines. So it's really an interdisciplinary um, program where and groups of, of young people who will be developing their uh, leadership skills and all the competencies based on uh, their partnership with uh, with the, the, the workplace. Like they, they have partners and uh, they work on projects and this is how they, they learn by doing, they learn through uh, solving problems, they learn by interacting with uh, the real, you know, like real uh, clients and based on real demands. And so the whole program is based on that. And it's been, you know, it's, it's, it's been really an amazing experience for, for our students and they're taking courses from different, so they can, the program is, is set as if you can take courses from different programs that you feel that they would actually answer your needs and then you build your own uh, program and then you use whatever you're learning to uh, solve the problem with the client and you actually come up at the end with uh, with a partnership with with the with this client whoever the you know the, the community or the, the you know whatever the, the the problem is or the demand is or the request is um so really depending on the students um the students uh, interest 
right? So I think this is this is one of the programs that is really uh, being innovative in our uh, university, and that is really answering to uh, to some of the things that we've been discussing until now. I put the I put the link in the in the chat. And there is a question actually, uh, on my right now. Uh, and the question goes, how would you successfully put in practice offering support guidance? I find it's hard uh, to encourage students to find their own solutions independently, perhaps because they're used to being given close guidance by professors in other courses. Mm -hmm. They may get lazy and get used to uh, learning that. So anyone would like to take that question? Okay, let's be clear, they're not being lazy. Um, what they're doing is analyzing and understanding the system as it is currently designed uh, and then providing results appropriate to that system. That's a process that was described long ago uh, by John Holt and persists to this day. Um, the answer is to stop doing that. I mean, and it's not the young people who need to change here, it's us. Seems as though Nadia would also <laughs> would also agree. Definitely not being lazy. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I just want to add something. I think again, how we like based on previous experiences during school, they are they they, they we make them view themselves as dependent on whatever we need to give them. So I, I remember at some point I was teaching at UIT, and now it's uh, Ontario Tech University, where the whole program is uh, in, you know, that we, we apply the, the problem-based learning approach and having the shift of students who have to come and really take control over their learning, whereas I was coming with no content, with problem to be solved, uh, they were really out of their comfort zone and yeah. they were really shocked by this, you know, the change of, of, of approach of paradigm. So I don't think that, definitely they're not lazy. It's really how, it's how we make them view themselves as if they need to be passive and really be controlled by us. And this is something as Sylvia was saying and you know, now we need to change that. There's a, sorry, before we go, there's a question, I apologize, uh, Lucaso. Uh, that, that's a live question, so if we can uh, ask you to ask your question. Okay. Well, if you can just, sorry, uh, look as well, if you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Sorry, uh, I think if we can ask you to uh, type your question in the in the in the, in the Q and A, and uh, we'll, we'll get to the answer. And we have about three more minutes left, so uh, if there are any uh, concluding comments from our lovely panelists, uh, that would be the time. Anyone would like to? Well, you know me, I can't not comment. <laughs> um, I just want to, when we talk about community engagement. Um, which I support, and I support co-op programs, etc. And I think these are great things. But we need to be careful and attentive to what we count as community. These engagements always, almost always involve companies or organizations of some sort. And that's something that old people have a lot of and young people don't. Uh, again, because of the whole means thing. And so when we're doing community engagement, proper so-called, what we're doing is a bunch of us old people are engaging with a bunch of other old people uh, in structured ways that give ourselves advantages. So I think community engagement should be much more, should, should look much more proactively to 
finding those people who aren't going to be rec uh, represented by these companies, these agencies, these societies, these NGOs, and think about how to engage them as well. Yeah, and sometimes it's nothing more than opening the door. One of my most formative experiences uh, as a young person was uh, making my way from rural Metcalf into Ottawa and going to the student radio station CKCU and handing them my script for a radio program and standing there as the person read the script over the air on live radio. Huge validating experience for me and all they needed to do was open the door. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, Lona, Stephen and Nadia for uh, this lovely presentation and discussion. Now, similar to the other one, we are going to go take a break right now, uh, and uh, we'll be back in uh, 15 minutes. So uh, if you need to step up from your device. Uh, also, I do encourage you to continue the discussion. And again, my apologies for missing some of the questions, and we have some technical problems as well. So continue to go on the chat again. And then, so once again, we'll be sharing information from one of our sponsors, Lapster, during the break. And uh, we'll be back in 15 minutes. Thank you.